Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks, Alan, uh, for the introduction. And um, I feel like I should be saying I'm lucky for being here. Um, there's a bit of a story behind my attendance in Adelaide. Um, as you might see on the on the board, I'm actually uh, officially based in Sweden uh, for the Swedish Museum of Natural History. I've been working there for the last three and a bit years, maybe nearly four years. And um, fortuitously, uh, just before the COVID chaos hit, I happened to be in Adelaide um, around January and February last year, before the travel restrictions all came crashing down. And I've become fairly settled and cozy ever since. So um, it's, a, it's quite a fortuitous area to be, as you, everyone knows who's been watching the news. And so I've been uh, I'm glad to actually start integrating myself a little bit better with the local uh, geologists and local biologists. Today, I'm actually glad to be wearing my ge geology hat. Usually I'm hanging around with more biology folks, so I get to dust my geo hat off a bit. I know, don't kick me out yet. Um, but uh, I'll try to justify that geo hat today. So uh, just a bit of background on mass extinctions, in particular, the, the big one, the, uh, the N Permian, the one that I've been working on. So there's been multiple pulses of, of bio, uh, biological cataclysms over uh, geological history. And there's sort of like the, the raw classification of the big five and then the others. So you've got the, the top uh, row indicating the big five, which are the end Permian, the end Ordovician, the late Devonian, the um, uh, late or the end Jurassic and end Cretaceous, the one that killed the dinosaurs. And then you've got a series of other little ones here uh, along the bottom row. And uh, if you look into the causes of, of these, they tend to be fairly strongly linked to large igneous provinces. So there's been a pretty strong uh, indication of, of large magmatic events uh, uh, correlated to the timing of these, uh, if not causally linked. And there's a, a series of, of the other mass extinctions that have uh, good evidence for large igneous provinces, but the link hasn't been strongly... Uh, that's fine. Ah, I see. Maybe, yep, should work, I think. Okay, um, so, oh, yeah. so uh, I'll, just, I'll just flag the little uh, K, uh, KPG extinction here because there is a mass extinction associated with that. There's also a giant rock associated with this large ignorance problem. So there's, there's a bit of controversy and it's pretty fun to watch the literature go back and forth about the, the cause of the end Cretaceous. So, you know, the dinosaur killer, was it the rock or was it volcanoes or was it a combination? So. Uh, the jury is, 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 is uh, I think it's probably still coming in uh, and that it's going to be a combination. But And you see here, this is the big one. This is the end Permian extinction where I've been looking at. And uh, it's sort of dwarfs the other ones in terms of the overall extinction rate. <clears throat> so this is essentially what Siberia would have looked like um, uh, 252 million years ago. Now, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm breaking some sort of nerd law by... This, the, by, uh, the reference of the title of the talk is actually A Song of Ice and Fire from Game of Thrones, but I, I'm combining my, my worlds here. That's, it seems like some sort of uh, uh, sacrilege here. But, um, but the large igneous province I'm talking about is this one in Siberia, and it's not the largest uh, igneous province in the world, but it, it probably has the largest amount of um, outgassing. So uh, for um, actually derived from the, the magmatic eruption, but also from the rocks that it, it was bursting through. So there's a good indication that the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from this eruption uh, was, were, were markedly higher than uh, the other ones that we've had actually managed to measure. And uh, this large igneous province is the recurring ultimate cause of these mass extinctions. But there's been more and more debate about the, the proximate causes, the, 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 the drivers of extinction, the, the sort of immediate causes of, of death of the animals and plants and other organisms. And so what, one of the questions I was, I was trying to uh, frame my research and frame this talk around is whether this thing was a unique event. Or was it just an end member of these extreme large igneous provinces? Is it a difference of degree or is it a difference of kind in terms of this overwhelmingly high uh, extinction rate for the end Permian. So then there's a whole spaghetti tree of, of, uh, of flowcharty uh, possible extinction drivers here. It gets a little complicated. Um, they go all the way from the mundane to the exotic. 
uh, some of the more exotic ones are heavy metal toxicity, like mercury, for example. Uh, there's a bit more evidence for that coming through nowadays. Uh, uh, I might just move this guy. Is that okay? Okay, cool. No worries. And oh, okay, no. There we go. Just move that guy there. Cool. All righty. I haven't deleted everyone at home yet, have I? Okay, sorry. So the more mundane ones are the ones that we may more maybe more familiar with, like uh, carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gases. And the, the evidence for these drivers is, is all the way from solid to tentative. Now, pretty much all of the extinction drivers on land or in freshwater systems are pretty tentative at, at the moment. Whereas in the marine record, things are looking a bit more solid and there's a bit more evidence, partly because of the much higher rate of preservation for marine records, that we have some pretty good uh, drivers of extinction for those oceanic uh, uh, organisms. So here's a couple of examples. Essentially, if you follow these little, little trails on the right, you've got um, a lot of outgassing from the Siberian traps. You've got uh, CO2 emissions from the volcanics, but also from the, uh, from the, inter, uh, from the magmatic uh, metamorphism of the local rocks. This leads to extreme warming, and then itself is enough to kill off a lot of the organisms. And then you've got another sort of semi path through here, which is the an oceanic anoxia, just driven by the warming as well as other factors. So there's a there's this nice little, you know, almost a, a clean uh, relationship between these uh, ultimate to proximate causes. So here's a little illustration of those two. So in the in the oceans, here's a, here's a model of, of how uh, the species in the oceans may have gone extinct, and this is increasingly. Uh, uh, um, a more robust model of how things went bad in the oceans. So if you go too deep, essentially you're looking at uh, hypoxia. You, the organisms are dying from a lack of oxygen because of the, uh, the sluggish circulation of the oceans, but also the, um, the problem of diffusing oxygen at high water temperature. And then if you go into the, into the uppermost part of the ocean, essentially the water just gets too damn hot and the organisms have real trouble uh, surviving. So you end up with this narrow refuge or Goldilocks zone where it's not too deep, not too shallow. It's sort of not, it's not so depleted of oxygen that they're going to suffocate and it's not so hot that they're gonna uh, cook to death. Not literally, not boiling, but uh, beyond their tolerance ranges. And there's a whole series of different um, evidence for this. And one of the ones that I want to draw your attention towards is, is the extinction selectivity. So essentially looking at the organisms themselves, seeing what uh, uh, ecological niches they inhabit, and then seeing which ones go get wiped out. So, and the survivors that actually make it through the extinction can tell us a lot about what sort of uh, drivers were going on at the time. So <clears throat> if this really is just a difference of degree for the end Permian, then the, this extinction event may be a really important end member to a whole series of other extinctions. Essentially, if this is just uh, turning up the heat higher than any other uh, record, then what we could say is that all the other extinction events may just be another part on that spectrum. And that if you look at this guy, because it has such a strong signal, we might be able to learn a lot about these smaller events. And it may even include some important lessons for the modern extinction. Uh, if the drivers are not too exotic, and if it really can ex be explained by some of the, the things that we're causing today. So the, the continental mass extinction record, the, the, the name of my project was really to to delve into the, the continental records and see if we can uh, narrow down the time frame of these extinctions, but also really see if we can tease out some of those uh, proximate causes, those, those drivers of extinction for the land and freshwater ecosystems. So another good reason for being stuck in, uh, in Australia is it's not too far from my fieldwork. The fieldwork is all in the east coast of Australia. I'm looking at the Sydney Basin and a little bit in Queensland, and now I'm moving into Tasmania. So these are some pretty nice continuous continental records of the end Permian extinction. And at the time, we're looking pretty high latitude, uh, all mashed together into the southern part of Pangaea. Uh, and this is uh, where we were placed at the time. Lots and lots of outcrops and lots of well cores through there, uh, mostly for uh, water and, and uh, coal uh, uh, prospecting. So uh, that gives us lots of opportunity for sampling and the preservation is spectacular. Uh, 
if you go to say Tasmania, where you look at the rocks uh, around there, there's been quite a bit of um, thermal maturation of the rocks because of uh, Jurassic dolerite intrusions. So the, the preservation is not particularly good compared to say uh, in Sydney or, or Queensland. But overall, it's um, it's it's pretty uh, pretty exquisite preservation. So combining the core materials and the outcrops, you can get a whole series of different data. I've been spending most of my time looking at the, the fossil plants in the big plants and the little plants, these spores and pollen over here. Uh, but we've also done a lot of um, radiogenic isotope age uh, estimates. We're doing uh, stable isotopes of, of various sorts, uh, XRF uh, for uh, weathering proxies, and we're doing some climate models as well. So a whole series of different um, uh, avenues to really tackle this problem. So this is not going to be the main focus of the talk, but this is something that's really quite interesting came out earlier, uh, was that with those really high, high resolution uh, age controls, we started finding an interesting pattern that the, the plants that were our market for the extinction of it uh, died off pretty early compared to the marine record. And how early? Probably about 300,000 or more years before the first rumblings of, of, of disaster in the marine record. And this is all being controlled by the, um, uh, this is by uh, age, age controlled by those radiogenic isotope ages. So we've got some pretty interesting uh, ideas that maybe something was going on on land before the oceans. And uh, this isn't just an isolated occurrence. It's actually now been confirmed since our first publication in 2019. It's been confirmed in South Africa and in continental records in China as well. So we're seeing that this isn't just an anomaly. It could just be a global and possibly a universal and uh, 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 geological, over geological timeframes, it may actually reoccur for ma other mass extinctions. So this is, is, is turning out to be a fairly solid thing. But like I said, it's not really the focus of the talk and we can have a chat about it later if you like. Because the, the big you know, $252 million question is why is it happening on land before the oceans? And that's a, it's a big kettle of fish that we can delve into, but um, right now we'll keep it simple. So I mentioned this is the loss of coal forming conditions and the plants that make the coals. Uh, you can see it in the, the plant record, in the, the leaf record, but also in the pollen record. So this black smear of pollen, this is a, you know, a relative abundance of, of pollen. You have these things that are being produced by those coal forming plants, the glossopterids, and then they pretty much go to nothing. Uh, and then you've got these tapering off uh, as you go further up the section. So you have a, a pretty strong uh, change of the, the floral uh, composition leading up to that extinction uh, reflected in the macro and the micro, uh, micro fossils. <clears throat> Interestingly enough though, that the, the plants have formed the coals in the mid Triassic, uh, they were there pretty early. So these things like dichroidium, this thing here, uh, this guy here was actually occurring pretty early in the, in the, in the, in the post-extinction world, but they were never occurring in high enough abundances to actually form coals in for several million years. So there's something wrong with the conditions at the time. And there's, this led to what's known as the coal gap, the early Triassic coal gap, which uh, it, where we basically don't have any coals occurring around the world for about five or six million years. Now, uh, this one thing that my advisor, uh, Steve McLaughlin raised early on in the project was, maybe what was happening it wasn't that you know it wasn't just like the world hit rock bottom and then everything was hunky-dory after that it may be that what ended up happening was it got bad and then it continued to get worse for quite a long time it could just be that if this was just such an inhospitable time for for these coal forming plants that the the, the system was so uh, depauperate of of the right conditions that we just don't have them for um across well across the globe but particularly in this area so this is uh, this raised my my curiosity about looking into the long-term perspective. You know what's going on through this coal gap area. You know this uh, this several million years after that extinction. Can you see that sort of? <clears throat> okay, so the end Permian was the end of an era, not just you know in a literal sense because it was the end of the Paleozoic era, but it's also the the end of the major uh, photosynthetic organisms on on the on the land and in the freshwater systems. So on a continent, supercontinent wide scale, we basically see the total loss or near total loss of the, um, the carbon sinks and the uh, primary producers uh, were being almost entirely replaced at that time. So we're talking about the land plants and the freshwater algae. 
And these provinces, all these biomes of fresh water and, and land plants were basically wiped clean off the face of the earth. So here's a, here's a little illustration of what I'm talking about. So here's some freshwater um, uh, algae that you see across the southern part of Gondwana. These are some you know, typical Gondwanan taxa of algae that we saw. Uh, they're very widespread. You can see by the crosshatch, this is the, the one going from top right to bottom left is the pre-extinction uh, distribution of these of this uh, of this genus. And then the, the, the other crosshatch, well, the, sorry, the, um, the other diagonal stripes uh, indicating what, what was uh, where they occurred after the extinction. So they have a much more contracted range after the extinction. And this is not just one species, you see it for multiple genera, all having this massively contracted uh, ranges. And then uh, we, we decided to uh, basically just determine that this, this algal province uh, we, uh, it was, it was so distinctive and that it matched up so well with the plant story that it, it's sort of deserving of its own, of its own province. So we call it the Peltocystia province, which is this thing, this ugly looking thing here. And essentially after the extinction, it was almost completely wiped out. You just have these isolated pockets and there's no longer one cohesive, uh, province at all. So, and it pretty much matches up to that Glossopteris, uh, biome that we talked about before. So the, the Glossopteris biome was wiped clean and you end up losing all of that entire group. Uh, in the algae, they were constricted to these tiny little pockets. And so this really was the end of the dominant uh, floral regimes of that time. And they were in, in place for several million years before the extinction. So this is one of the things that I, I really like to hammer home is the fact that we're not just talking about a species loss. We're talking about an ecosystem collapse. This is a, and it's not being replaced by some new, you know, uh, uh, coal forming, you know, peat system. This is actually just a complete wiping clean of that of that entire biome for several million years. So this is not just, yeah, like I said, not just a loss of species. We're actually seeing ecosystem loss. So the numbers, the actual species loss numbers might not be as impressive as say the animal uh, faunas in the, or the, the faunas in the marine record, but um, the actual biome loss is, is possibly the biggest story that we want to talk about. So in, if we get really granular, if we look up close and personal at the outcrops in, and in the cores, what does it look like? What do the fossils tell us? What do the sediments of geochemistry, uh, what do the actual data say when you put your hand up against the rock like that and see, what, see it up in close and personal? So this is what we call the dead zone. This is the, the interval where there's not much going on biologically. Uh, it's you can narrow it down. We've, we just published a paper on on this this new unit called we call the Fraser Beach member, and it's pretty small. It's uh, if you if you sort of brush over it, you'll miss it. It's only between 50 to 140 centimeters thick, and it doesn't actually occur in some cores because of the scouring by the river uh, river systems above. But where it is exposed and where it's continuous, its maximum thickness is less than two meters. Now, what is this? Well, it's just a bunch of organic rich uh, mudstone, some minor sandstones, and it, it's a good indicator for some uh, pretty, uh, uh, well, it's lacustrine and fluvial system. Uh, and the duration we've na managed to narrow down to, uh, 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 yeah, to roughly 20,000 or so years uh, use, using those um, radiogenic isotopes and the sedimentation rates of the time. Geochemically, what's happening? Well, the stable isotopes or the stable carbon goes on the pretty extre extreme excursion to the to the negative, um, and there's a pretty high weathering rate based on the chemical index of alteration. Now, I'm not a geochemist, so I'm not entirely sure how all the inner workings of the CIA works, and well, you know, that CIA, and um, and the stable isotope. But we can talk about that later. I can give you a bit of a background on that. Now, based on the based on some of the geochemical data, we can get a we can narrow down the um, the, the temperature increase and the CO two uh, changes, and we do some climate models to have a look and see what we what we expect there. <clears throat> now, what we what the, the model shows is that there's a much higher increase in seasonality of precipitation. So, in other words, you go from an ever wet condition to more of a seasonal mega monsoon condition where you have extremely wet uh, summers and very dry um, uh, 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 winters and uh, ephemeral lakes, uh, lakes that don't uh, last all year round a lot of the time. How about the fossils? Well, what sort of fossils would you expect to find in a dead zone? Well, not much, okay? 
So it's, uh, it's basically, it's dead zone for a reason. And uh, the only fossils we have found are not body fossils at all. They're actually just, well, actually you don't even find crickets. The insect had a hard time as well. So uh, it's uh, no large body fossils, but we do find things that are caused by large organisms, well, larger uh, tracks and burrows. So what was causing these little things? So they're not huge. These things are they're about 20, 30 centimeters wide or so. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, not 20 centimeters. Sorry, they're about uh, four or five uh, centimeters wide, I should say. Um, and uh, they're pretty long though. They go down into the underlying uh, coal measures as well. So they go from the top of this dead zone all the way into, uh, into the underlying uh, pre-extinction rocks. And here's a bit of a, a model of, of what we found. We found basically this whole section of this dead zone has been riddled by these little burrows. Uh, we haven't found any critters inside the burrows yet, but based on the geometry of these of these uh, the burrows in cross section, based on their similarity to ones where there have been bones found inside in South Africa, we're probably looking at something like this thing. This is Thrinaxodon. It's a very weird sort of uh, ancestral uh, group to uh, the mammals, and these were what they call estivation burrows. These are these are little uh, homes to hide away from the, the chaos going on upstairs, essentially. So um, this is a pretty important way for survival during this, this dead zone. <clears throat> what else is going on? Well, I, I sort of lied when I said there was no other fossils because we do find fossils, but it's not really what you would typically think of as a fossil. So this is a nice reconstruction of, of the pre-extinction world, very happy, lots of veggies, you know, uh, relatively low water tables because of all the evapotranspiration by the, by the, uh, the plants. <clears throat> then you have the ex mass extinction events. And essentially what you have is a whole bunch of charcoal or well, this black opaque uh, 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 fossil charcoal. So it is, a, is a, it is a fossil there, but it's not exactly the, the, the sort you might expect. Um, <clears throat> when you look at a transmitter light, it just looks like a bunch of black stuff on, on a white you know, background. If you start looking at it with reflected light, you can see that it is very high um, reflectance that you'd expect from uh, charcoal. And you can also compare it to some of this non charcoalified stuff. So not all of this black stuff you see on the left is, is charcoal, but a lot of it is. We're talking you know, somewhere between 50 and 70%. So much, much higher charcoal than you'd expect from the sort of background rate. So lots of fire going on in this, in this interval. And uh, Essentially, once you cut down all those trees, either through fire or just through overheating the plants, the water, the water tables rise and you end up with this, this pooling going on. And you get these, uh, uh, these, uh, these lake uh, deposits forming where originally there was um, uh, a quite nice peatlands. So <clears throat> this is essentially what, you happen, what happens when you end up deforesting large areas of wetlands today. You end up with a water table rise because the, the plants are not, no longer uh, causing that evapotranspiration. So the water ends up just pooling, coming in from underneath and uh, the water tables uh, actually come up through them. <clears throat> so from the rising from the ashes of that devastating dead zone, what sort of species do we find in, in the earliest stages? So the first signals are things like this, these disaster species. So these are, these are species that uh, do pretty well in very stressed environmental conditions and are good markers for uh, for an extreme imbalance in your ecosystem. So things like this guy, as we saw, is doing okay. Other things like in, in South Africa, other little vertebrates, very, um, very uh, uh, typical, um, what they call the Permian pig was doing well, Lystrosaurus. And it was, it's, it's very, very common in South Africa, but it's pretty much monospecific. You end up with one or two species and not much else going on. You end up with this fungi going on though. You have lots and lots of micro uh, spores of fungi and the, the idea is that this is saprophytic, uh, separ sorry, saprotrophic, essentially breaking down the dead organic matter in that area. You also have these opportunistic uh, ferns that were taking off. Now the ferns were before and after, but the, the, the loss of the, of, the over, of, the, uh, of the canopy and the loss of that overstory gave the, the ferns a chance to sort of break through and become like the, the dominant uh, floras for a time. And you also have lots of cyanobacteria and chlorophyte algae. So I'll get to that in a, in a moment and talk about that. <clears throat> so you may recognize, you know, during in ecosystems that are pretty stressed, you have organisms that go a bit crazy and you can think of 
some of our city friends as as disasters tackler in in some way. Essentially, they're the they're the cowards, the underdogs, the scum suckers, and the slime bags. That's what we've got here. So they're not. This is not the most. Uh, um, uh, it's a bit humbling the, those terms, but um, you know, it's essentially we're talking about a very uh, a miserable set of organisms that were coming in in the very early stages. <clears throat> so if you look at some of that, uh, we're going to we're going to go into the the slime story a bit more. Now, this is essentially what the uh, the bacterial uh, record looks like is really not much. It's it's amorphous organic matter, but if you look at it under fluorescence, it starts glowing pretty strongly. This is a good indicator for um, for bacterial AOM, and not only uh, bacterial, but you've also got some good evidence from the uh, from the the, uh, the geochemical data that we're looking at uh, bacterial plus um, not just but or as well as mixed in with that we have cyanobacteria, which is pretty important. I'll explain why in a second. And in the fossil uh, algal story, you have lots and lots of these chlorophytes. So green algae are taking off in big numbers. Now, part of the reason why they did so well is because they have these nice desiccation resistant walls, which allow them to sit in the soils during these ephemeral lake, uh, lake conditions. So once everything gets wet, uh, they start blooming. And then when the, it dries out, they stay in the soil until it becomes wet again. So these, uh, um, these became basically out of control during this, this time interval. I'll show you just how much. So basically, you don't have them really at all for a long time below the extinction. But as soon as that extinction kicks in, we're seeing huge in, uh, in, increase in their, their relative abundances, but also the concentration. So this little dashed line uh, along here for the algae shows that we're really getting into very extreme. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale. So we're talking uh, hundreds of thousands of, of individual algal specimens per gram of sediment. So very, very high concentrations. And this is typical of uh, modern algal blooms. So when I was writing, trying to write the name for this, this paper that we just published, I was coming up with these ideas like the slime kingdom or the slime dynasty. And as soon as you put that into Google, you get all sorts of weird images. Um, so I think that, I mean, this is, this, is refer, this is from some Japanese anime game. I mean, it shouldn't be surprising that there'd be something online. But I'm sure that if I shopped around a little bit further, there'd probably be some pornographic version, as, as there is uh, for everything, apparently. <laughs> so I'll just move along. And um, so the, uh, essentially, this, this three million year slime dynasty was, was taking over the uh, freshwater systems for that whole interval. And you, but at the very early stages, you have these pulses of extreme microbial concentration coming in for the first couple hundred thousand years or so. Now we're talking concentrations that are typical of modern uh, algal blooms or microbial blooms. And we're talking um, cyanobacteria plus these uh, green algae. And what ends up happening if you, if you increase their abundance to this level is they become toxic. The reason why is because the cyanobacteria produce uh, toxic byproducts during their metabolism. And just having that, that, not, that much, um, uh, well, having those organisms producing uh, and dying and basically uh, falling to the ocean or the uh, sorry the lake floor captures a lot of the ocean uh, captures a lot of the oxygen from the water so the uh, the water becomes very low in oxygen it kind of sounds paradoxical that the algae which are photosynthetic you know that actually create oxygen actually end up locking up more oxygen than they produce when they die in these uh, massive bloom events so that's why they become these toxic uh, soups of nastiness and you can see them in um, in areas which are have a lot of nutrients and a lot of heat warming going on. That's essentially the, the main three things you need for uh, algal blooms today. You need temperature, uh, you need nutrient influx, and you also need CO2. So uh, if you increase carbon dioxide, they go crazy. So this we've postulated as a major driver for freshwater extinctions. And because of the multiple pulses of these, of these uh, high concentration bloom events, they were probably delaying the, the, the recovery of these freshwater organisms for uh, quite a long time into the early, early Triassic. So here's the current model. Here's what we've got for our continental extinction. So we've got a nice, happy pre-extinction vegetation, you know, nice wetlands, lots of evapotranspiration, and you've got the water pretty much restricted to the, to the main water bodies, lakes and rivers. Then you have the impermeable event, uh, which leads to this very high temperature, high CO2, and seasonal precipitation instead of that ever wet conditions. And what ends up happening is the, uh, that extreme climate change 
you know, the, the increase in seasonality and increase in warming leads to uh, increase in fire pr uh, prevalence and deforestation either directly due to the fires themselves or just through heating. Uh, you decrease your evapotranspiration, so you end up with the increase in water, water tables and that loss of the vegetation basically destabilizes your soils. And so those nutrients are now free to wash into the, into the water bodies. <clears throat> so you end up with eutrophication and those high water tables, and which ends up flooding your lowlands and you have these toxic microbial blooms. And the blooms continue. Those, that algal dynasty lasted for quite a long time until you, it wasn't actually just a regular, you know, back to normal after a long time. You ended up having to wait for a cooling event called the Smithian Spathian event, which is 3 million years after the end Permian, for things actually started to go back to something approaching normal. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what we want to do that, at that point is see if the end Permian was a unique instance in time, or was this a recurring model? Can we see similar patterns in other events? So, we're looking at those top five, uh, the, the big five at the top again, and then you've got a, a series of those other extinction events along the bottom. And, at the, and you can see along here, you've got the, uh, the, the postulated uh, drive or the ultimate drivers of these extinctions. So nice little vol volcanic uh, symbols for the end Permian and a few of the other mass extinctions. <clears throat> and what you end up finding with the, uh, with the microbial record is in the, in the marine record, partly like I mentioned before, the, the, the records are just better preserved. So you end up seeing them a bit better. You see these algal events and the, micro, well, the, the bacterial and um, algal events going on for pretty much all of these mass extinctions whenever you have these uh, magmatically driven uh, uh, extinctions. Uh, but on the continental record, it's not so well uh, established. And that's not really because uh, people have looked and not found it. It's because it, no one's really been looking. Uh, what we have found is that when you do look, you do find these microbial events uh, the, the, the records aren't continuous and they're not really, uh, you don't have a, a perfect, um, uh, 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 you don't have the records for both micro uh, algae and bacteria for all these events. But when you do look into that, uh, you do find that these um, hypothermal, uh, magmatically driven hypothermal events are linked to these algal blooms. So um, um, it's, it's, it seems like there's more and more evidence that this sort of uh, this sort of model may be applying to more than just the end Permian, and that we may be able to use this as the end member for a whole series of other extinction events. Now, what you'll also notice is that the end Cretaceous doesn't have <clears throat> doesn't have a whole lot of algal uh, um, uh, uh, blooming going on. They've, they've found uh, an increase in local uh, bacterial growth in the marine records, uh, but on land there doesn't seem to be much going on at all. And there's been some debate about the fire record as well, uh, whether that's actually a strong fire signal at the end Cretaceous. Now, the reason why I mentioned that is because of all the other ones we see here, that's the one with the big rock uh, associated with it. It may be that this was, a, this was the unique one and the other ones are more of the, 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 the path, the course. So we, uh, it's, there's really a, a, an ongoing discussion about how relevant uh, this model will apply to these impact driven extinctions. Um, but I think that there's fairly solid case to go hunting in the continental records for all these other ones for these algal and microbial blooms. Yes, unfortunately, we have to come back and find what's going on there. Uh, don't worry about that. Okay, and if you look back far enough, the actual fossils themselves, they start taking on a bit of a similarity to some of the oldest known uh, non-marine fossils that we have. So if we go back, this is what they call those anachronistic fossil assemblages or um, uh, microbial mats that have sort of come back from the, from the dead after hundreds of millions of years. And they start looking a bit like, hmm, this is from the end Permian. And these are the, the fossils that you find in the Sydney Basin. They start looking like the fossils you find from the Mesoproterozoic from, from lacustrian se sediments. Uh, these are from Scotland, uh, but the Torridonian. And so you start seeing, yeah, maybe there's some similarity in this sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, devastated areas that you end up with these microbes coming back, sort of retaking the world for a, for a small blink of time and uh, um, before they get uh, pushed back into, into the annals of history. So this is a, you know, it's a bit of a romantic model, but it's not really, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to think about, but it's not really like we have reenacted the conditions of the Mesoproterozoic, but just for a small glimmer of time, it looks like there's 
this is a good marker for very devastated uh, local conditions. Now I mentioned the Holocene here is maybe useful. Uh, warming, deforestation, and wildfires in wetland carbon sinks. If this is starting to sound familiar, maybe you've been watching the news for the last year. <clears throat> uh, wildfires and algal blooms, maybe the canaries in the charcoal mine for, for devastations, uh, not just in the past, but maybe in the future. Now, if you look at the, the ongoing uh, wetland fires in the Pantanal in Brazil, essentially you have a, an increase in your, uh, not just, well, not just because of the fires, but in overall you have an increase in seasonality and you also have these, these uh, increased fire and uh, frequency, but also um, uh, distributions. And who'd have thought you're actually finding algal blooms there as well, or microbial blooms in these uh, newly devastated areas in the world's largest wetlands today. So keep an eye on this as maybe something to be uh, concerned about if we just increase the CO2 and increase the temperature. Plus, you know, burning and agriculture, which is another important couple of factors. <clears throat> so, um, so in terms of the actual, going back to our model, there's a whole series of different uh, drivers here. I like the, the more simple model because we have a, have a bit of a, um, we're starting to get a stronger case that this may be enough to explain it just from those two by themselves. This is, this is my little model. I'll just end on this one, just to give an idea of how this sort of greenhouse gas driven model may work. Now we have evidence for all of these, these proximate causes nowadays. Um, and it may just be that if we just crank up the, the greenhouse gas emissions from you know, the impermian uh, uh, Siberian traps, you lead to this warming and seasonality. And if we start over here, we can see that the warming and seasonality itself can be enough to cause land extinctions, as well as freshwater extinctions, but basically pushing the organisms out of their tolerance range for the temperature or, or uh, uh, the climatic range. And then you end up with increasing wildfires, which once again can cause widespread you know, uh, loss of life, maybe not to the plants themselves, but to the animals, uh, leading to deforestation as well as the warming. And then you end up with that sort of cascade down into the soil loss, which feeds into the microbial blooms uh, in the freshwater mass extinction. Now, another important little hook here is this one, that the greenhouse gases themselves and the temperature actually increase the, pro the, the likelihood of microbial blooms. So there's nice little interweaving webs of, of interactions here. And I think that we might be having, um, might be converging on something that might explain some of the selectivity of our species loss on land. <clears throat> so there's still room for more exotic factors. And given the present state of our world, I'm kind of hoping that the impermian extinction is a, is a model of what happens from exotic extinction factors and not the ones that are happening nowadays. Now, what's left? The big questions are, well, does this, this pattern of microbial extinctions and, uh, um, uh, sorry, microbial uh, blooms and, and wildfires as it occur all the way through Australia. Now, the good thing about Australia is we've got about 2000 kilometer latitude, latitudinal gradients here from Bowen Basin all the way to, down to Tassie, which we can actually get these uh, records from. So we actually see more or less what was happening across about 2000 uh, mile, sorry, 2000 kilometer uh, stretch of land. And that's more or less the same sort of range of latitudes we had during the impermian. Did the, uh, the plants themselves, were they just reaching the, the threshold of what they could handle in terms of the fire temperature, fire frequency? We can actually analyze the, the records using biomarkers or even the charcoal uh, themselves to, to work out what sort of temperatures and frequencies we're talking about. Uh, the selectivity of the plants. Now, the plants that survived, were they adapted to fire? Were they adapted to low nutrient soils? These are things that we can delve into as well. And the, do we really have good evidence for these algal, toxic algal blooms in other, um, other extinction events? So keep your eyes open for that. So thanks for listening, folks. Uh, I'll leave you there and just give a sh quick shout out to um, my lovely colleagues and uh, the folks that have been helping me here in Adelaide. And thank you very much for inviting me to chat today. Thank <laughs> you.